Before we start the review, I want to take you guys back a couple of years in the Sir Chancelot canon. I'd been uploading to the channel pretty often by that point, but it was mostly just Undertale and Minecraft Let's Plays, but I had the ambition to make something big. So when my family went to the beach for a weekend, I knew it was the perfect time to make my full feature horror film. Even though it was only 30 minutes long, but I put full feature in the title. Anyway, here's the chilling opening scene. Oh my gosh, it's right behind me! <laughs> Hi. You're probably wondering how it all got down to this, where these things are chasing us into extinction. Well, let me explain. As you can tell from this, this is actually shot in the first person, which was at the time pretty revolutionary. The basic plot was that Diet Coke has chemicals that make people turn stupid if they don't drink it once every five days, and, and they then don't, so then they one day a girl stops and drinking Diet Coke and then that blows works, up the Diet Coke and 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 the Diet Basically, it was an absolute masterpiece. Here's a memorable scene where the zombie leader sets out to blow up the Diet Coke factory. There it is, the Diet Coke factory. Mercy swiftly set up an explosive and would soon explode the Diet Coke factory. All Marcy had to do was push the detonator. Oh no. Oh no, it exploded! You ever wonder what happens to the kids that don't get beaten? The reason I'm telling you all this is to show that I know what it's like to make a less traditional horror film, and how much I can appreciate one that's done right. Lake Among Us has been labeled by some as the scariest horror movie ever made, and while I disagree with that because of this, 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 and this, I will say it's possibly the most unsettling film I've ever seen. I realize most of you have never even heard of this movie, much less seen it, so before I go any further, I just want to highly recommend that you go and watch it. The best way I can describe the film is if Twin Peaks was combined with a ghost story and then edited to look like Orson Welles' F for Fake. It's available on all of these platforms, and it's actually free on Tubi.tv, so I highly recommend you guys go watch it, I mean it's under 90 minutes, and then come back and watch this when you're done. On the surface, there's really not that much to the story. Alice Palmer drowns in a lake and then haunts her family until they discover her secrets and free her spirit, with various twists and turns along the way. Now that alone probably sounds mildly interesting at best, but it's nothing that hasn't been done a thousand times before, which you would be correct in thinking. But the story has so many more layers beneath its surface that you would be doing yourself a great disservice if you were to write this off as boring or unoriginal. The cast all on the way back from the dam. But the only gear that I could get it into was reverse. So we drove back into town in reverse. It was an awful, awful night. Worst night of our lives. Mm -hmm. The way this film feels is incredibly unique and genuine, which I mainly attribute to its presentation. It's without any explanation. Uh, Russell and I met actually on the Gippsland catchment project in 98 and uh, worked together on that. So you guys have known each other for a few years? Yeah, good few years, yeah. Get a couple of shots with me, mates! <laughs> a good eye, mates! <laughs> Kangaroos! If you haven't figured it out yet, the entire film was presented as a documentary about the supernatural events following Alice Palmer's death. And in that regard, it is flawless. The performances are phenomenal, the dialogue's realistic, the way the old footage looks is perfect, and even the editing is totally on point the entire time. The film genuinely feels like a documentary, so much so that this is one of the top results when you Google the movie's name. Another tool that the film uses to its full advantage is subtlety. There's one part where Roderick from Diary of a Wimpy Kid records a bunch of footage of the house and then sees the ghost of Alice doing a bunch of creepy stuff and then that scares the parents into thinking Alice might not actually be dead and they misidentified the body and so then they DNA test the body to make sure it actually was her but then it turns out that it was and so the parents finally have closure but then it turns out that Michael Sarah actually faked all that footage by using his movie magic powers so that his parents were finally able to have that closure by confirming the DNA test 
twist. But then there's an even bigger twist when Alice keeps showing up in pictures, even though Jim from the office isn't even there and can't be faking them. But then there's an even bigger twist when they look back at the pictures that Zach Hill faked and discover that the real ghost of Alice was there the whole time. And this is all before the time-traveling ghost is introduced. What I'm trying to say is that this movie isn't afraid to treat the viewer like they actually have a brain and can think about what they're being shown. There's just so much going on in this movie and it all works together flawlessly to create something that is genuinely scary. What was this man doing in my house, in my daughter's room, more than six months after her death? The rock greatest warrior. He is king of WWE. You watch something like The Invisible Man and think, oh wow, that sure was scary. I sure am glad that I will never be in any of those circumstances at any point in my life ever. And then you go to sleep. With this movie, I watched it at 11 a.m. in a fully lit house with other people in it, and I still felt the need to glance over my shoulder every so often. And keep in mind, all of this is still only talking about the surface level of the film's meaning. There's so much left open to interpretation that it's pointless for anyone to really try to explain it in a review. To me, this entire film is more of a metaphor for the process of grief more than it is an actual concrete story. There's really no way I can go into any more detail without getting into theorizing territory, but this seems like the type of movie that's perfect for someone to break down and analyze, so I'll leave that up to them. Before we go any further, I do just want to list a couple of other things that I thought the film did really well, but I didn't really know where to put them in the reviews, so here you go. The score definitely had a strong presence throughout the entire film, but they still managed to know exactly when to let the visuals do the talking and let the score take the back seat. I mean, the whole thing sounded like a Death Grip song was about to start at any moment. It fit perfectly. The cinematography and editing and making this look like a news package plays a huge role in the effectiveness of the film. Instead of having the camera just be still and perfectly framed, they're constantly adjusting it, just like you would see at a local news station. I mean, it looks like it genuinely could have been my final exam project in my media arts class. The way they got the old footage to look is refreshingly realistic. It always bothers me when movies have a character record something on a Nokia phone and then show 8K footage of it later. What this film is able to do with so little is fascinating. The amount of effort the actors and director put into this is incredible. The only real downside to it is how inaccessible it is. I mean, this is what the physical copy looks like. I mean, what, what does that even mean? According to IMDb, it barely made back 1% of its budget and has fairly mixed reviews, which I can only assume is because it's so much up to interpretation that I guess a lot of people just took it at surface value and glossed over the deeper aspects of it. I mean, the only criticism I really have of the movie is just that it almost did its job too well. The director tricks the audience by presenting this concrete and realistic news package while secretly having an eraserhead level elements for the audience to figure out for themselves. I mean, calling this movie underrated is almost an understatement. I mean, look at how barren this Wikipedia and IMDb is. With one notable exception. The only trivia this film has on its IMDb is that it was mentioned by Red Letter Media once. It's honestly a little depressing to see how under the radar this film has gone, considering how much attention this soulless schlock gets. Even though all I had was a can of Diet Coke, a fidget spinner, and a pack of Cheez-Its, I still made my movie. Not because I thought it would be any good, but because I had passion about what I was doing. Lake Mungo is a prime example of a film that was crafted with precision and care by someone who clearly knows what they're doing. Tension, creativity, and misdirection are all utilized to the fullest extent and are completely effective in making a truly memorable film. I give Lake Mungo a 8.5 out of a hundred. There just weren't enough jump scares for me to really enjoy. This is the worst thing I've ever seen in my life! Ugh! Get it away from me, man! 